Okay, well, we are going to get started bang on time. Welcome, everybody, and, and thank you for joining us today. And thanks for everyone who arrived so early. We were having some technical difficulties on our side, so we kicked off the session about 10 minutes early to make sure it wouldn't work. It does actually mean that one of our panellists is currently struggling to join as well today. So bear with us if we have somebody jump in during the session. We'll, we'll make sure this works for everybody. But welcome to another webinar Wednesday uh, put on by Midstream Lighting. And, and today's topic is all about the terminal of today. Before we dive into the session and before we kick off this panel discussion, um, uh, a little bit of webinar protocol. Oh, fantastic, Hamdi's joined us as well. Um, a little bit of webinar protocol. You are all muted. However, you can interact with us on Zoom. There's a Q&A section and the chat box. So please feel free to throw any questions at us during the session in the Q&A box, or feel free to chat to us or to your peers on this call in the chat box. We love to hear you and communicate with you on the platform as we present the panel. There will be a follow-up email after the session with a link to watch the recording, links to any resources that might get mentioned, as well as some of the details about the panelists in case anybody wants to reach out and contact one another. There is also a survey that will pop up at the end as well. Um, this is quick four questions. It helps us plan our future webinars. So if you can fill that in, that would be really, really appreciated. So the terminal today, this is today's webinars. And the big question that we're asking and covering today is around, should we stop thinking so much about the technology of the future and focus on the technology of now? Now, we all understand that future gazing is an integral part of the evolution of the shipping industry. With discussions on the terminal of tomorrow and the fleet of the future capturing people's imagination. But the long-term impact of the global pandemic, however, as well as growing environmental ambition in many sectors, have created even more discussion than usual about what the future of our industry may look like. However, such speculation rather than action leaves us at risk of missing out on a huge gains which can be achieved with assets that are already available to us. And in spite of the financial repercussions of COVID-19, we're still seeing substantial investment in global ports and terminals. This is clearly apparent in recent notable investments. For example, the Port of Seattle has approved a terminal upgrade in its $3.7 billion 2021 budget. Likewise, the Port of Houston saw huge investments, not only its balance operations, but to redevelop existing assets with new technologies, exactly what we're talking about today. In these projects, increasing safety, increasing efficiency and sustainability were highlighted as the main areas to benefit from such investment. However, it goes without saying that the more time spent speculating about the future, the longer we'll continue to live with avoidable inefficiencies, risks and emissions right now. So today, this is our focus. We are going to look at the technologies that are available now that could support ports and terminal operators, enhancing efficiencies, and obviously what can be done to create commercial gains, of course. So I'm delighted to say we have a five person panel here today. So hopefully this doesn't turn into complete chaos as it can do on Zoom. So bear with us, uh, it is a five person panel and it is an incredible panel of uh, guests that we have with you. Uh, joining us today. So I'm going to very, very quickly introduce our guests for you. And then I've set them a challenge. They're going to get 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds to an elevator pitch on their individual businesses. This is them just giving you the rough and dirty who they are before we get rid of all the PowerPoints and we focus purely on a panel. So first of all, we've got Hamdi Nadhara. He's the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Red Sea Gateway Terminal, the largest container terminal in Saudi and the Red Sea. He is a transformational leader, an entrepreneur, and has almost two decades of experience playing a pivotal role in executing the development plan and strategy of the company and orchestrating the team in strategic expansion projects, supply chain, IT, and technical services. His vast experience uh, covers FMCG, maritime industries, uh, and has got multifunctional expertise in ports, international value chains, commodity hedging, startups, B2G negotiations, and in 2020, Hamdi led the consolidation and merger on the ground of two terminals in North Jeddah part, uh, port smoothly during the pandemic with no loss of productivity, performance, people or, or data. 
He's also got about 15 degrees, but we're not going to go into that. And we're going to move on to the next guest that we have, who is Adam Sharp. Um, he is the global maritime principal from NIRAS. Adam is a chartered civil engineer with over 15 years experience, predominantly in the field of maritime and ports. He has an extensive track record of delivering tailored engineering solutions on major maritime projects, and he specializes in port master planning. His focus has been on international projects relating to container, um, oil and gas, bulk terminals, and he's worked on worldwide maritime projects in the UK, Middle East, Africa, Asia. Um, and he's also acted as the UK's young representative for the PIANC Working Group 172. We in our industry, we love numbers and letters. It's extremely confusing sometimes. And that was for the design of small to medium LNG terminals, including bunkering facilities. So welcome, Adam. We also have Andreas Richter joining us. Uh, he's the area sales manager for mobile harbor cranes and reach stacker at Lieber. Andreas is an engineer at heart, holding both a bachelor and master's degree in engineering. He's had almost 10 years experience in the maritime industry, uh, working for Lieber Group, where he's progressed from project manager all the way to leading sales in both North and Central America, as well as North and Central Europe. The product responsibility within the Lever Group that he holds is the mobile harbour crane and the reach stacker. And furthermore, his tasks include things like key account management for selected major customers of Lever's maritime products. So a fantastic addition from, a, uh, from an engineering standpoint, as well as a product standpoint over at Lever. And then we have our two colleagues from um, Midstream Lighting join us. The first is Mark Naylor. He's the maritime manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa. He's an experienced sales and marketing professional who, again, has an extensive maritime background, both in the UK and internationally, covering, uh, I think it's over 11 years for Mark. Before joining Midstream Lighting, he was at Heister Yale Group, a major worldwide container handler, lift truck and general materials handling solutions manufacturer. And whilst he was there, he was appointed as their industry manager for ports and terminals. Before that, Mark worked at Kelvin Hughes, a maritime radar engineering company, that provides solutions for private, uh, commercial, as well as military markets. So you can be rest assured that Mark does actually know what he's talking about, even though sometimes he comes across like he might not. <laughs> and we also have Rory McBride, um, our sales manager for, for Americas here at Midstream Lighting. Rory, again, has over a decade of experience earned in the maritime industries for companies all over the world, where he's been involved in key projects for some of the world's largest ports. Uh, he holds a number of degrees in international business, international affairs and economics, and this is both in US and Chinese user universities. He worked previously for ZPMC in China, a heavy duty equipment manufacturer, and then following this four years at Lieber, where his experience spanned Austria, Germany and, uh, and um, the US, where he's based in Miami. Miami. Um, this is where he leads our US and America's function for us. He speaks four languages, including Mandarin, hence the Chinese university and being able to get through that process. And he oversees the America's market and development for our maritime related projects. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, what I'm gonna ask is, I'm gonna start with Adam, if that's okay. And if Adam, you can unmute yourself and can you give us your elevator pitch so everyone who's joined us understands a little bit more about who NIRAS are. Sure. And uh, nearest, we are a consultant engineering company, international consultancy engineering. Um, we work um, mainly, well, my team within ports and harbours and in the fields of maritime civil engineering, geotechnical, coastal, port infrastructure, pavements, ICT networks, offshore energy support, basically in, in all sectors that ports will need to help out. Um, and we work through all stages there, you know, starting at the feasibility and master planning stage through concept, preliminary detailed design, helping out with procurement, the construction, um, either on the client side or, or from a design side. Um, but also we are interested in helping out managing those assets once they are built um, and also undertaking technical due diligence for people looking to purchase maritime areas um we have 51 offices internationally in 70 tw sorry 27 countries about two and a half thousand staff and we're currently working on about seven thousand live projects 
amazing fantastic background and, and really excited to hear some of your views on this topic adam because you've got some really really interesting technologies to talk to um our attendees about so next andreas uh, if you can mute yourself and tell us a little bit about neva maritime cranes sure so thank you very much for having me i am here live from rostock where let's say on the wonderful day with wonderful weather at the maritime headquarters of Lieper. Uh, it's in the north of Germany, as you can see on the, on the map, on the small map that I have implemented. So this is the place where we create and uh, build the wonderful cranes that bring joy and improvement all over the world. In basically every port, no, not every port, but in every country in the world, which has access to the ocean. Um, the Maritime Division is one of the 11 divisions of Leaper. So Leaper is a way bigger company than the Maritime Division itself, but I'm speaking only for the Maritime Division here. Um, so we're talking about uh, four facilities where we build ship shore cranes, uh, RTGs, RMGs. We build reach deckers in Sunderland, uh, ship crane, offshore cranes, and mobile harbor cranes in Rostock. And uh, construction equipment also in, in uh, Nansing. Basically what we do here, we build cranes which bring every cargo that you can expect from the vessel to the shore or the other way around uh, into every country in the world. And that's it from my side so far. Fantastic, Andreas. And again, from your side, very interested to see some of the technologies that we can implement now, because when we think about what you do on the crane side, it is usually a major investment, something that we look at in the future. So you've got some really interesting topics in there. Uh, and additions that you're going to add to this panel. So thank you for joining us. Now, uh, Hamdi, um, would you be able to introduce Red Sea Gateway to us, please, if you just unmute yourself, fantastic. Thank you, Michael and uh, everyone. I'm uh, glad that um, I'm joining this uh, uh, discussion and uh, about Red Sea Gateway Terminal, we are the largest uh, terminal in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, on the Red Sea, uh, we are located in Jitta port. Um, uh, we've been uh, there from uh, 2006, where we had our first build, operate, and transfer agreement with the government. Uh, we had already uh, consolidated uh, another terminal within Jitta port, enhancing our uh, uh, our capacity uh, from 1.5 million now to 3.2 million, and with the master plan vision to go up to 9 million TUs for the coming 30 years. And this is what is our agreement uh, with the government. Our shareholders, as you can see, is uh, we have Costco shipping line, uh, which is the main uh, major shipping line in the world. And uh, with the BIF, uh, which is the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia, is one of the major shareholders to ensure the vision 2030 of Saudi Arabia is already implemented in the port sector as well, enhancing all the operations definitely in the uh, Red Sea. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me and uh, excited to look, uh, to look forward to, the, to this informative uh, panel. Thanks, Hamdi. And, and for all of us who are joining today, it's fantastic to have an operator on because you're going to be challenged with how you look at now and the future. And, and that's a very, very difficult perspective to have. And then Mark, if I could just ask you to jump on and talk uh, a little bit about midstream lighting, please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll also iterate, thank you very much for having me on the panel today. And it's a great pleasure. And your introduction was spectacular, Michael. I, I must repay the favor at some point. So who are Midstream Lighting? Well, we started off life in 2009 as an LED distributor, come forward a few years to 2016, and we've now got our own manufacturing facility in both the UK and Europe. We have three offices from which we run global. So we have our HQ in London, we have our design center in Milan, and then our US headquarters where Rory's joining us from in Miami. We are a global company, we look after five what we would call niche sectors of LED solutions. That's sport, horticulture, aviation, military, and of course, maritime. We've got over 35 global partners and growing, which enables us to provide 24 seven support to our customers. It's all centrally managed from London and Milan. And in our short time, we've already won eight international awards, including 
being presented twice by Her Majesty the Queen in 2018 for innovation and in 2020 for international trade. Our solutions are designed to reduce energy consumption, they improve security, cut maintenance, they minimize the environmental impact, which is crucial in the modern port. We also are very proud of the work that we have done to improve safety. Safety is critical. It's one of the foundations on which all ports and terminals, equipment manufacturers, is what we deliver. And as a part of the package, we improved the general lighting quality immensely. So an interesting fact about us in 2009, we were the technology of tomorrow, and now we are the technology of today. <laughs> Love it, Mark. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, which hopefully means that you guys will be able to see uh, all of us on one panel together as if we are sat on a stage in front of you all. So just a reminder, don't forget, there's the Q&A function, there's the chat function. Please get engaged and talk to us and ask us questions as we go. Um, but with regards to the actual session itself right now, we're going to split this into three parts. The first part is going to be based on the background of what we really mean by the terminal today and understand a little bit more about the status quo, about whether actually ports and terminals are thinking too far ahead or not, and where our panellists have maybe seen this. The second part of the session is going to be based around demystifying the smart port. Now, this covers everything from data to automation. We've got some really interesting questions to fire at the team here um, around that topic. And the third part is we're going to focus on sustainability. Now, this is a really important topic now, right now for ports and operators all over the world. And it, the question is really, how can you continue to be sustainable whilst improving technologies now and in the future? And there's a big, big topic of discussion around that. At the end of the session, hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A, but if anything comes up during the session from you, and thank you for those who actually provided Q&A before the session, it is extremely helpful when we get them in in advance. We'll be using your questions um, as we go through the session. So let's move straight into part one and look at the background on what we mean by the terminal today. So part of each of our jobs is to prepare and plan and look to the future. It's imperative as leaders in the industry and in our companies that we do that. However, how do you actually get the balance right, you know, in terms of being, being about the future and about now? So a question maybe, Adam, if, if I can start with you with this, is do you think the maritime industry has at times tried to look too far ahead instead of looking at technologies of now? Where do you see that fitting? Yeah, I, th I think it can be hard and it can certainly be tempting because all of the media and the news you normally see is focused in on on that glamorous, distant technology. Um, but but certainly, you know, the journey to a smart port, for instance, isn't one big step, but a combination of many smaller steps along the way. And, and the best way to do that is part of an integrated master plan to actually get to that point, utilising smaller steps and and the key really is making sure that the technology and the crucial maintenance and capex money that a port has now is utilized to get you to that future area yeah and i think and mark maybe you can add a little view of this because of your experience both um obviously at heister and now midstream what do you think the industry because you've and, and the same probably goes for rory and andreas with regards to future thinkings with these big, big products. How have you seen the industry? Have they been looking too far ahead, potentially? I think it's a very, uh, it's an interesting one, and, and it depends on what aspect. So certainly, if we look at energy, for instance, the there's a huge amount of talk about hydrogen, about LNG, about lithium ion, and there's not a lot of clarity. So people are almost grinding to a halt thinking, well, I've got diesel, but where do I go next? And that's one of the issues is that there is no clear signposting. So people are left in a sort of a, um, a, a quagmire that they have to make a decision, but the decision costs money. Delaying the decision costs money, but making the wrong decision costs more money. Mm. So then you have to try and find that balance 
And what you need is obviously to take proven technology, but how does it become proven without someone being an early adopter? And, and therein lies the crux of the marine and the maritime industry. We are not traditionally early adopters. So it's a cultural shift that's needed as well. And I, I think, also. no, no, I was gonna say, Rory, from your standpoint as well, because it's similar backgrounds, um, do you feel the same? It's, it's that inability to move quickly, which is actually people are thinking ahead, they want to get there, but it's it's a bit stilted because of the fact that you still have to look at now and it's getting that balance right. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. You know, some of the traditional challenges that have always kind of persisted in the port environment is <clears throat> one kind of having uh, competing interests. Um, it, you know, some are fighting for new cranes, others are fighting for reworking the decks. Um, others are looking at improving efficiencies, and it's about negotiating a lot of those concerns from the different divisions of a port and balancing them. And this can obviously create a lot of challenges in which direction we're we going in, because usually when a lot of these plans are made, they're kind of focusing a lot on what they want to become in these five to 10 year time. And these are usually kind of much higher level kind of targets that don't really get the kind of granularized approach to achieving them. And unfortunately, this ends up kind of taking a lot of attention away from uh, the things that can be done today with all eyes kind of really being focused on what could be done tomorrow. And I think this leads really nicely on to, to Hamdi because from your standpoint, you are a port operator and we've all mentioned here that technology changes fast and you've always got to be thinking, you've got to be thinking about everything as well as the now. So. How do you, as the operator, make decisions uh, on what to do to the terminal today versus what to do in five, 10, 20 years from now? So how do you get that balance right now in focusing on the terminal of now as well as the terminal of the future? Uh, actually, this is a very challenging one. Uh, and thank you for asking this question. Because to be honest, when we started the business, we always look at when we talk about the master plan, for example, just we finished now our consolidation and we just finished our master plan with, uh, with a very uh, reputed uh, company. And uh, one of the things that we were looking for now, we are investing here for the 30, for the coming 30 years. And we are looking with, on an eye on the automation. And if you look at the evolution of ports, you will find that the ports mostly came into four, there is four main phases of the ports where Phase one, where it was talking about management by hero, and then uh, management by process, then management by exception, and the future is looking at managing to orchestrate the physical inf information flow inside and outside of the port. Now, today, what we look at when we look at ourselves, we find ourselves in managing managing by processes, where terminal operating systems are the main. Uh, the main uh, subject and what is this uh, operating system and how it is, uh, it is working. Uh, we are moving now to this management by exception where we have to integrate automation, equipment, algorithm, optimize these processes and reduce the human capital on it and we just keep it for, uh, for interfering in the exception. Now, when we started the master plan, I think it's very simple. There is no one size fits all. And the way that we started, you will have this first question come in and say, you know, what, what is your priority? And when we, do, we discuss it internally, we start with productivity, our clients, customers, and then our labor force and how we can uh, manage uh, and balance between our labor force needs and at the same time, the uh, automation and the third thing is emissions. So yes, this is what is what we are looking for to reach to port number or port version 3.0, where we can now manage by exception. Um, the theme of the uh, of the panel talking about shall we stop looking at the future? To be honest, the future is is there, but it is very for us it's very dreamy, and we need just to go with baby steps. And uh, uh, the first step is actually to look at what, how we can optimize the process that we have uh, and define what are the automation points that we need uh, to integrate without losing 
our productivities or our efficiencies toward our customers. And I think, Hamdi, that's exactly where we're trying to come out with this panel is, of course, the future thinking is so important, but those smaller steps that you can maybe take to optimize and, and get those wins in the process are where there's going to be sort of um, positive outcomes. And interestingly, Richard Butcher just dropped in the chat that it is very difficult because technology is changing so much faster nowadays and the need to actually obtain an ROI on that technology within the first three years is, is critical. And maybe Andreas, um, this is a bit of a curveball because we didn't talk about this, but how does Libra look at that from obtaining ROI on technology in the short term? Because three years for me seems like a very, very short period. Is that something that you talk about when you're looking at your solutions and getting that ROI quickly? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's maybe one thing we can say, there's technology of the future, something like I've heard already, um, hydrogen and so energy resources that will not uh, create, create any harm on the environment or however you call it. But there are also intermediate steps. Like I say today, um, you will have at some point the, the fully electric drives and all the stuff, which basically we have already, but the most um, demanded the product at the moment is still a diesel motor. So you find it still everywhere. So, and if we talk about this, if you, if you use this, still, it should be, if you're using technology of today, it should be at least the most efficient that you can get on the market. This is what I say. Um, before you enter into the new technology, enter into a new grid, and to spend a lot of money into developing all this, just look, what are you doing right now? Where do you burn your money? Where you lose your efficiency? And where you can save costs in order to be competitive and maybe uh, attract new customers to your port. And this is what I say. Uh, Andreas, I think that is such a critical point. Uh, and Rory, it kind of leads in nicely to, to my next question, which is with regards to the fact that as a group here, we are all in contact with ports and terminals around the world. Um, and I suppose, Rory, in your eyes, how many ports and terminals at the moment are running current technologies that are not uh, as efficient as they could be? Bearing in mind, you know, Andreas talks there a little bit about diesel is still the most popular. So you need to make sure that the diesel you're using is the most popular. So just from a snapshot from the US market, you know, if you're going to say, you look at that, how many ports and terminals do you think currently are actually running solutions that are inefficient and could be easy wins if they make that change? Well, you don't uh, have to I'm name sure. any port. Yeah. You don't have to name anybody, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll save, uh, save the names. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'd have to say that I haven't come across a single port that has really addressed everything that they could really address. And, uh, you know, unfortunately you don't see a, a lot of consistency in the types of things that ports are addressing. Um, right now, say, because on the West Coast, uh, there are a lot of rebates for LED type technologies and energy savings technologies. So anything focused on that is, is very, very interesting to people now. When those uh, rebates go away, their level of interest goes away with it commensurately. And it, you know, the lack of seeing any kind of, I would say cohesive strategy, like Andreas was saying to say, before we really start looking at, should we get new cranes or should we uh, you know, make additional investments into the strength of our deck and in different uh, technologies and things, what are we doing currently today? How do we balance uh, efficiencies of what we are currently are doing with the increase in the bottom line with equipment purchases, for instance. How are those two things negotiated between each other? And I think it's a really important aspect that unfortunately I find now seems to really be falling more on the shoulders of salespeople like uh, Andreas, Mark and I, that uh, it's our jobs really now to come in and help companies really understand where there are these kind of hidden efficiencies, um, things that their perspective may not be targeted on because of you know, maybe larger ticketed items like, uh, you know, major cranes and things like this. But there, it's amazing the amount of energy efficiencies uh, that can be gained through a variety of products beyond LEDs. And the lack of understanding of those options is, is striking. Um, I, I can lay it out as simple as this, that I have yet to see any, uh, any port really with uh, a role a job position as head of efficiencies, for instance, and just taking a look at everything that they're currently doing and how do we make what we currently do become more efficient? 
Can, can I come in on that, Michael? Yeah, I was going to say, actually, I was going to you next anyway, Adam. So yeah, yeah, go for it. So I was going to say, you know, this is part of what we're seeing changing, actually, as part of master plans. Of course, historically, master plans were very much looking at the, the main physical natures of how many births do I have? How much do I expect to have in the future? But of course, that's now developed a lot more into more of the detailed layouts, you know, how can you make your layouts more efficient, which not only increases your productivity, but also then starts reducing the diesel use in your equipment and so on. But then also is going into that, that extra area, as Hamdi was saying, his master plan, when you're looking at automation, you know, automation needs to be done as part of an integrated strategy. It shouldn't be done at the whim of the port operator and, and a particular technology they like. It needs to fit the customer. Um, by the customer, that's not just the shipping companies. It's actually the whole um, the whole chain, the whole supply chain, which the port is part of, and and we need to be aware of that. And uh, we're certainly finding that in terms of reference of port mass plans. Now the ports are smartening up, and it's it's more than just that physical area. It's also looking into the staffing. How does that change? If you're getting into a smart port, your profile of staff changes. Looking at the equipment, as you're saying, you know, where does the new equipment come from? When when can we adopt it? When is a good time to do that? Again, fitting the traffic. Um, and, and obviously lighting and, and maintenance of key structures and everything else is all integrated in with that these days. So here's a question for you then, Adams, because you, you brought it up. Do you think smart ports proceed automated ports? Yeah, that, that's a good question, isn't it? Because the term smart port can mean all sorts of things to different people. I think um, a wide misconception is you see a smart port as a state-of-the-art automated container port, but um, it can mean so much more than that. And it, it's very much a, it's, it's not a, is a port smart or not? Is it's There's a number of items that can make a port smart, but um Certainly, a port doesn't go from a traditional port handling um, transactions with paper and, and just doing what they've always done to suddenly being a state-of-the-art container terminal automated and so on. And, you know, just because you're not a container terminal doesn't mean you're not a smart port. And um, a number of the, the, the steps to get there is digitizing these processes, uh, um, handling customs uh, information, um, keeping track of where containers are in the yard um, all sorts of areas like this need to be part of the, the whole thing and integrated in with the supply chains as well um, and it needs to be digitized first because automation is very very good uh, as long as everything is is pretty much standardized it's not very good at handling exceptions for instance so it's it's not for everyone absolutely um, and, and this is leading us into part two which is this idea about the smart port and we're talking about data right now in this section. So, so Handy, from a Red Sea Gateway point of view, how are you currently then using smart data within your terminal? And is this something that's been brought in recently or have you been doing this, this for a long time? Because data and this smart idea is new technology, but it can be implemented right now. So how are you currently looking at data to drive your decisions? Oh, let me... There you go. Yeah, thank you. And uh, but just let me uh, address what Adam mentioned. It was interesting about uh, smart ports versus uh, normal ports. And actually, the way that you look at it, if it's which is better or which is best, I think it depends on the clients, to be honest, the client point of view, you know, and his WTB or willingness to pay. Uh, so if as as smart as it gets and as smart as you are in the end, if this is if if the smart port did not produce what the customer is looking for or the client, and then he will not call at your terminal, or if he will call you and he will just, you know, ask for these three base or whatever. And the same time as vice versa, you know, if I'm investing in all of these smart technologies and the end it and not delivering for him whatever he would like to see, I think I'm, uh, the ROI will go very yeah, go down. Now, back to your question, you know, digital transformation port, I think in my, uh, it has four main elements, you know, it's, are we talking about the robotic process automation? Are we talking about vision of computer computers and uh, how we are utilizing it, STS printers and gates? A third one is the machine learning. 
And this is the one that I see very interesting, to be honest, uh, where we have a real time planning, uh, uh, better equipment, the location, the yard, uh, dual cycling. And the fourth point is the blockchain. Uh, and the blockchain means, meaning especially in the port community system, data sharing of uh, intelligent uh, to intelligence sharing. Now, these are the four main areas that we, when we look at the master plan, we, we used to look at it and we looked at which one are, to be, to be honest, take the priority. And to be honest, the port community system and the blockchain integrating stakeholders like customs, like ports, like the uh, you know agents uh, with the terminal, definitely with the rail whatsoever. This is the most hard and the hardest one. And I, I just want to you know, I just discuss this data sharing is very important. That is, it takes us most of the sixty to seventy percent of the time. Uh, discussing with all stakeholders, like uh, mentioned by Adam, master plan before that you were walk, sitting on your vacuum and just doing a master plan based on vessel sizes and that's it's not working anymore. I have a master plan. The port authority have a master plan. The customs, they have also their own master plan. And if I'm doing a master plan in vacuum, it will not work. So data sharing between all of us is very important. Now, what we did, uh, as an example, we were the first one to integrate our data with customs. Tremendous uh, efficiencies. We reduced about 16, 16% almost or 17% of the paper flow. Uh, we did it in 2016. But this small step, it was small, it was efficient, it was very selective, had uh, tremendous uh, efficiencies in the dual days of the containers. And imagine that 14 days of containers staying in the port reduced to reach to three days because of small data sharing steps uh, between us and the customs. This is a huge, a huge uh, milestone that we have achieved. We are looking to do this uh, more now and we lack to be honest, the port community system today. But now everyone in the, between the stakeholders internally are looking for it. So this is, I think, one of the steps. I don't say, I, don't, I will not say the future, in the future because port community system exists elsewhere uh, in Singapore and uh, in, uh, Rotterdam and everywhere. But here still the port community system is under development. But I think this is one of the things that we need to, uh, to look uh, for it, to integrate it between uh, different stakeholders. And I think that's really, really key, Ham, because all that what you're talking about and that data management is available right now. And there obviously it's easier said than done, but people need to start thinking about how to integrate uh, sooner rather than later. Andreas, on this point of, of data, um, and it's funny because a question has come in from a guest as well around innovation in your product portfolio. And I wanted you to maybe tell us a little about um, our lead at because this is data management and this is something that's available right now within your infrastructure. And I don't know from your standpoint, how many of your clients uh, are using it to its full potential. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's interesting with the full potential. Basically, I can even just connect to what Hamdi says. Everybody has a different uh, master plan and this is exactly what is the case if you have the uh, technical management or you have the economic management. And with these technologies like LIDAT, where you collect all this data, LIDAT, uh, meanwhile, because we are developing, of course, our product as well, has been substituted by a LIDAT smart app, we call it. Now a web-based version where you can even when you, I don't know, wake up and before you brush your teeth, you can check on your smart device <laughs> what the crane has been done during the night shift, how efficient it was, what the costs are. And so the maintenance crew can sit there. Basically what the program says, it takes all information the crane can give you puts it into graph and puts it into several dashboard. Means how many container I have put through, how many consumption do I have? Means in the end, you can see how much does it cost for me to have a container put from the vessel to the shore the other way around. And also you can put the graphs together to see the consumption um, and the efficiency of the crane commercially wise to maybe set offers for your clients within the port to attract new business, new shipping lines. Um, so everybody with a master plan can use the data, can sit in front of this program, which is, of course, connectable with uh, existing um, port operating systems. 
and can get the data and we support them helping to see where the efficiency is lacking and where they can save costs and where they can gain more productivity because it's, it's, it's inseparable to have the, the turnover of these cranes. So how much units they are moving and how much is cost. It's inseparable, it's just what we talk about uh, efficiency and this already we're coming back. So everything is there. A, a smart port for me is, is not just having all this data available, but taking smart decisions out of the information that you get. Absolutely. And that you mentioned efficiency. And I think, Mark, one of the things, and we're going to have to talk about it because we are midstream lighting after all, but LED lighting, you know, it is a smart solution. It's been used the world over across different industries because it is a smart solution. So tell us a little bit about efficiencies that can be saved by, for example, something small such as lighting and that smart solution being implemented. Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a very good point for us. Let's take something like a, uh, a classic ship to shore crane could have anything up to 51 kilowatt floodlights. So that's a uh, 50 kilowatt installed power base. We can switch that with a 300 watt LED light and give better lighting results. So you're already making a 70% efficiency there. And it goes beyond that because your maintenance, your longevity, the energy draw, so the cost, you're gonna get your ROI within that magic three years. Um, where Rory is operating, of course, he's in uh, territory with us quite a lot of rebates. So, you know, that, that's a massive incentive there. And again, on the high mast lighting, you can remove your HID lighting and you can get 60, 70% efficiency. You use fewer LEDs, you use less power, and yet you improve the light quality. And I think, you know, from the smart standpoint as well, obviously with LEDs, it's easy to control. You can do Absolutely. lots more in terms of um, on-off timing, et cetera. It's just a, that level of efficiencies. And obviously we can portray data back to customers from an LED standpoint, so they can understand more about their lighting solution. Adam, from Newest standpoint, there's another really interesting piece of technology that, um, that, that exists within you with regards to digital asset management. Um, and we've spoken about it, the laser scanning side of things. Do you wanna give us a little bit of insight into that? Because it's again, data is king and what you're providing is an easy way to really know so much about your term, port and terminal that probably has never been done before. Exactly, yeah. Um, acid management is something that can be easily overlooked by ports. Everything looks great until it's not, and then it's very much not. Um, and, and I know prudent ports and most ports are, are good at at least undertaking yearly or five yearly inspections of their assets. Uh, underwater, that can be quite difficult, though. Uh, you will need to bring in divers. Uh, and there can be all sorts of issues with turbidity of water, you know, seeing where you are, looking through the videos. And, and if there is a problem found, actually knowing exactly where on the wall it is and, and the progress of those issues over time. So what we're implementing at the moment now is, is, is laser scanning technology of these assets. And I've got a good example behind me here of a breakwater in Peterborough in Scotland uh, that we've looked at. And... Um, this is really good technology because in terms of pricing, it's, it's probably comparable to a diver survey, but much quicker. Uh, we, we can scan probably up to about 20 meter depth and about 20 meter width of the seabed floor in just one pass of a boat. Uh, and the output, of course, it, you don't need to worry about uh, conditions of the water with it not being uh, visible enough or that kind of thing but you get a, a 3d output afterwards which you can look at and measure essentially to the millimeter of, of all the assets it's, it's really good data um, and and you can use this of course with um, with with photographs photogrammetry above water level and you can actually create highly highly detailed images of these assets effectively cre creating a digital twin of a whole port if you like and obviously, over time, this this can show measurable um, savings in that you can actually see the progress of any issues. You can have a very, very detailed single source of truth of, of what these walls are looking like, uh, which can then be given to whoever needs it, whether it's for your 
issues uh, to consultants to look at strengthening or deepening a key wall or indeed insurance companies as well to show uh, the conditions of these walls in, in very easy to digest quick detail over the number of years, but also the maintenance that you undertake on that. So it, it's a very powerful tool. And of course, looking then to the future, it also leads itself open to uh, machine learning tools, which are development in the future where, where these issues can be automatically identified and put together on a schedule. But of course, that's the far distant future. So we're not quite there yet. But um, if you start this now, then you've got a good bank of data that can be used for that um, and, and for relatively little, if any, extra cost. I mean, it's a great piece of technology that's available now that can help only not, not just now, but in the future. Uh, Rory, question for you. We're talking about some of these tactics and approaches, but from, from your experience on both sides, from, a, from, a, from our side, as well as working with Libra, uh, how easy are these tactics and solutions from your standpoint actually uh, able to be implemented? Because, you know, we're talking about the terminal of now, how easy is it for ports and operators from your view to be able to take some of these tactics and, and get them done? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Michael. And kind of to really add on to the items that uh, Adam and Andreas and, and uh, of course, Mark were speaking to, we're, you know, really looking at these things really are not difficult to implement. For me, my perspective is it's the awareness of them that is really where the challenge lies. Um, like I said before about the perspectives of the relevant departments and what their focuses are, you know, it's very easy to miss out on very simple solutions that could be implemented, uh, as well as miss out on a lot of the data that does exist. Um, to take an example, um, you know, with the lead app, like Andreas was mentioning, you know, things like this can help you with planned maintenance. Um, you can set up schedules inside of these things so that, you know, you know when after a certain amount of moves that X, uh, whatever component would need to be replaced. And the same applies with our LED technology. Um, in, in the past, when you would have to uh, pretty much go around and check light levels to determine whether your solutions were still compliant with OSHA requirements, um, through the uh, application of control systems, they can actually start extracting this data and tell you what the active power levels of each unit are, um, as well as what the consumption is and what then the planned date for replacement would be. Now, this may not seem uh, like anything significant, but the reality really is when it comes to LEDs that generally speaking, the cost of exchanging them and replacing them is more than the cost of uh, the unit itself. And, you know, the amount of efficiencies that could be wasted here in time of the, the labor of people, you know, just imagine you have uh, one pole you need to replace the lights on. Well, the next month you find out you have another pole. Well, with the, the data and the effect of the data of a control system, you could determine that, well, within the next two months, I would need to go replace all of these. So instead of sending and deploying two separate crews on two separate months, detracting from some other work that they could be doing, you can say, listen, over the next two months, we need to do this. So let's just do it all right now. And, sure. and that's just a very simple example of an efficiency gain that just comes from uh, more sophisticated planning, which is derived from the data that you would get. And so that's where what I see is so important is that, it, you know, the, there's a big distance between what you're going to get and what it's actually going to do and kind of getting people along that road to understanding that, yes, why do I need a control system on a light? Well, let me explain to you all these little details that lead up to this being a good decision. And, you know, it's about bringing people along. And once they're there, then the information is easily digested. But sure. that's really where the challenge lies, is the, just the awareness of what they could do. Uh, can I, can I, I come in here, Michael? Absolutely. Quickly? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, and this seems to be a common theme to me of, of all of these technologies we're talking about, Rory, with the lighting, with the LIDAT, and, and with the laser scanning. It's all, the, the real advantages are to do with maintenance, aren't they? And the maintenance costs. And I think when we're talking about far off technologies, it's always that big, sexy, big picture in the future when there's some real savings to be made in, in what we're all talking about here is asset management. And that, that is obviously developing your port and moving it forward. Uh, but that's really where we're not talking about it. Yeah, but also an avenue to fund that mm. part of the future. It, you know, with all of these increased efficiency gains across all of these different products like yours and That's ours, up, yeah. that these actually provide a real vehicle to reach that that uh, master plan point in the future and the funding for it. 
Yeah, and there's a centralization of data, which again, all three of these technologies are compatible with. And that's really, I think what we're all leaning towards at the moment uh, in the portal today, as far as I can see from this is exactly that. It's centralizing this data together and, and there's some real power that can be used. I that. think there, there is also a, a word of, uh, let's call it warning, that whilst data is fantastic, you actually have to use the data. And whilst at Heister, the number of customers who took out telemetry to understand what their reach stackers were doing, they would take it out and then six months later, they'd say, I've not saved any money. Okay, but did you look at the data? No. So the culture has to change. It has to be a culture of data consumption and usage to make decisions. It's not enough just to buy the solution. It takes more of a fundamental change in the thinking. So Hamdi, from your standpoint, because uh, Christopher's just actually dropped in the chat a really interesting aspect. And it leads on from what Mark's saying there about handling the data and a, and a culture change. You've got an exceptionally smart port that you're running at Red Sea Gateway. So what are you currently doing today with the technology available to you um, to become more efficient? Um, so what are you actually implementing right now to improve those efficiencies? You know, it's an extremely smart port that you've you've got. Uh, I, I, I hope that we have that smart port. Uh, I think we still have a uh, way to go, but... Uh, uh, this is an interesting question. We were, we are now in a lot of, uh, since, since 2016, we started our process excellency department and transformation office. Many projects now are worked with the teams uh, yeah, bottom up and uh, they are bringing their, we are listening from the teams and then we can see what are the ideas that can be implemented to achieve our goals. Now, one of the interesting points that was touched by, uh, by, the, by the panel here is adaptation and how we can make the people adapt uh, to the technologies that is already there. By the way, if we just, we need just to look closer. I'll give you an example, terminal operating system that we have now. It has a lot of modules. People are, are not tending to use the modules and it is there. We have modules like prime route, like expert decking, whatsoever that is, that are, if we give a chance, we will have a better planning on the yard. We'll have a better efficiencies and utilization of our terminal truck, uh, trucks, TTs, and so on. And for, uh, for a year or more than that, we were looking for why it's not working. The problem is that is the resistance. We will need to just start trusting these modules. And we start to go to this phase of port, what I call 3.0, from 2.0 to 3.0 to manage, to go from managing, managing from a process perspective to managing from exception point of view, where I need this system to do the job and you interfere only when it is needed to be, ex to, 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 when, it, when, it, when it is needed. And dealing with exceptions is what I want my manpower and people to work on. Uh, we had a success story on the OCR system where it, we just took out everyone out of the gates. It took us about two years, but in the end, okay, we had about uh, six people per shift. We multiplied this by two, maybe this is about 12 people. Now we don't have except three people. And they are only going when there is an exception in the gate, a problem they go in. And we want to implement the same technology in the uh, port, in the uh, terminal operating system as well. We have a lot of modules that works with the art planning, the art strategy, uh, TT optimization. And we just need to focus and use what is there before we just go and dream about the, the future and what's going on. And I think from, sorry, Mark, because we're, we're gradually running out of time and I want to touch on the sustainability side of things um, and I want to move on. So actually, Mark, let's let's come to you for this first question on the sustainability standpoint. Yeah. So power consumption is a big topic. Reducing power means reducing energy consumption, reduces cost, <laughs> and it obviously therefore is better for the environment. So can you, and it's probably very quickly because you've spoken about it already, but from a midstream standpoint, um, 
where do we talk about power consumption? And I know that we can make a huge difference. I mean, it all starts with our uh, a simulation. And I think I can actually answer one of the questions that's come in at the same time. So for every project that comes in, it is treated as a individual project. We don't have a, an off the shelf solution. Every port has its own unique requirements, its own unique environment, its own unique culture. We start by understanding the port and what they want to do. We then create the lighting design, which will deliver the efficiencies. So mast by mast, floodlight by floodlight, we look at what we need to light up to so the task area. Our aim is to use the fewest floodlights and the smartest technology to do that. So that could be rather than using DALI, for instance, which is giving you your dimming, you know, Rory did an install where it's got motion sensors. So we can really tailor a, a solution to deliver efficiency the way the port wants. And it's very individual. So what we call sustainable, what we want to achieve, we have to align that with the customer. And that's really important, which is why this point I really want to stress is that we are aimed at delivering to the customer. And what their goals are, there are our goals. At a top level, yes, it's to be green and sustainable. But what does that mean to them? That's what we deliver. And I think that's really important from also, Andreas, from your standpoint, because when you talk about delivering for the customer, and you mentioned it earlier about diesel being the most um, requested product still to your customers, but we know that Libra is always talking about decarbonization of equipment, no fuel, no oil, going all electric. And it still feels for me that that is obviously sustainable, but it's very much future planning. So what are you doing right now with regards to um, the efficiency of diesel, let's say, within your products that can be a great technology for now, but is also ticking that sustainability box? Right. Um, I talked about diesel as a uh, intermediate phase that we are still providing. Um, for sure, we are already on the road towards the future, maybe already a step further. So if we talk about decarbonization, this is the product we already have. So we entered already or we introduced already a, a E-series that we have um, named called LPS 420E and this, and we are developing further support the train, which is really fully uh, electric, or we call it uh, um, 100% electric means there's not even a cylinder to move the boom. So you have to, you have everything electric and don't have any hydraulics in it anymore. So the decarbonization is completely uh, reached already there. Uh, this is thanks to the development team that we have within Rostock. So everything is developed here, produced and tested. And I think we are on the road. We can deliver for the next 10 years the required um, diesel and hydraulic machines even longer, but also if we're talking about the future planning, fully electric train, this is something we can do by today as well already. And I think Eva has just put a question in and it's kind of exactly where we're coming from. And I don't know how Hamdi deals with this on his side, but it's around the idea that can we actually catch up with all the technology and keep up to date? Because we're always chasing the next piece of technology. And she's asked, are we talking about adopting ports right now with minimum important proven technology, which can contribute to the efficiency of ports and I think it's both. I think what we're trying to say here is that it's not, we know that it's not focusing on the terminal of now. Of course you have to talk about the terminal of future but it is talking about what we could do right now that can have that positive effect. And I'm interested Hamley from, from your standpoint on the sustainability side, how much are you looking at operational efficiencies and gains and the technology of now aligned with sustainability or is it actually everything crosses over with sustainability now and you can't really make a decision without thinking about the sustainability of the port? Where, where does that sit at Red Sea? Well, this is a question that we always uh, we, we always think about even in the master plan when we just finalized it. And we when we just started even the, uh, the investment of the new key trains and RTGs that we already bought in 2020, uh, we invested carefully on RTGs that that are, that uh, work uh, with less emissions. And uh, now, we, for example, we are using now the smaller diesel uh, tanks uh, actually in the RTGs to ensure that these tanks are only uh, used for 
uh, empowering the battery of the uh, electricity than before the, where we used to have these diesel doing the whole job of, for, uh, for empowering RPGs. So this is something that we are now working on and uh, from the beginning when we started the infrastructure we used the, the green cement uh, for, uh, for our uh, for our kernel. So yes, this is something that we address always. Uh, we have targets that we have to achieve by 2030 vision, uh, looking at, uh, at, at uh, the future. Uh, definitely also the key cranes that we already invested in are key cranes that are based on remote controlling, so that also we reduce this uh, interaction of people with the going out uh, and, and working from the outside of the out. So this is something that we address now and uh, we, we always look at. LED lights definitely now it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something that we already started with. So, uh, but we'll go back also to Mark, I think with the expansion to uh, discuss with him some opportunities. And uh, I appreciate it. And actually, uh, I just checked the time. It is four o'clock and we've already ran uh, into the full hour. And I had another few questions to go through and Adam, a few more things for you, but bearing in mind that everybody uh, likes these webinars to finish on time and, and close up. We're, we're going to close it down for today. Um, we've got everybody's questions that came in and from the chat, and we'll make sure that we'll get back to everybody who asked us any questions. Um, and to everyone who joined us today, thank you so much um, for giving up an hour to listen to uh, the five of our guests talk. Hamdi, Andreas, Mark, Rory and Adam, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we finally got on. We didn't have any technical issues, which is great. And I think it's been a really interesting topic. And I think it's something that everybody who's joined us today as a guest, we need to start thinking about. Let's start thinking about right now, not just the future, because there are many technologies that all of us can talk about, whether it's midstream, near us, or Libra, that can be implemented into ports all over the world. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to the panel. It was great. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks guys. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. That's perfect. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Cheers.